This is an introductory lecture to Computer Assisted Legal Research for PLA 1730. The introdu to introduce the topic, we're going to cover these points. And this presentation is based on several sources, including our text, our course textbook. Um, and uh, these topics are the ones we're going to cover. In addition to the course textbook, the very last slide has some references to some other research that I applied in preparing this lecture. So it's not developed, this lecture isn't developed entirely on the textbook. What is Computer Assisted Legal Research, or otherwise known as CALR? Computer Assisted Legal Research is a method for conducting legal research using computers, smartphones, other electronic devices. Uh, to access databases of information using research software or the internet. Technology offers legal, re legal researchers a great alternative to the traditional print law library and in, especially in locating things like statutes, case law, administrative regulations, secondary sources, and legal reference materials. These uh, sources of law we'll talk more about in this class. Again, this is an introduction to set a foundation to, to help you understand. The internet um, has also made a big, uh, a really huge impact on the practice of law and in the way legal research is performed. The impact of the internet, the, has, the, of the internet has been significant on the practice of law and in the way that legal research is performed. The shift from books to electronic research has been beneficial to small firms and solo practitioners with, uh, who have neither the budget nor the space to house an extensive print library. In private law firms and corporate departments, the space to shelve rap the rapidly expanding and um, very expensive sometimes print collections is being converted to offices now for attorneys and paralegals who generate revenue for the firm. For law firms with multiple locations and attorneys and staff who access information remotely, the library is now a laptop computer or another a different mo mobile device that has internet access. So a few myths that are uncovered from the research that I want to explore with you a little bit. Um, myth number one, everything is on the web. Well, do we still need books for legal research if everything is on the, on the web? The research shows, the research about electronic research shows that the answer to whether we still need books for legal research is an unqualified yes. With everything is on the web, the first myth that's probably the most pervasive misconception in the world of research. In order to see if that is true, let's take a look at what is available on the free web. The advent, advent of the internet has been a godsend for lawyers, librarians, legal researchers. They're all using the internet for their, for their research uh, work. Statutes and administrative regulations are currently available for federal government and all 50 states. Some materials are available for District of Columbia, Puerto Rico, Guam, and the Virgin Islands. However, life is not perfect on the internet. Not all gears are available, and there are differences between states in the amount of material you can find online. I would recommend that you check the Florida Supreme Court and the Florida District Court of Appeals websites, and you'll see that the case opinions available on those sites do not date back to the first days of these courts. Why not? It's economics. The digitizing of items on the web is done by experts, often called taxonomists. They are no longer catalogers doing this type of work. It's more expensive to do this than one would um, assume. So a highly trained cataloger called a taxonomer is doing the work. Myth number two. Everything is available on Lexis or, Nex Lexis or Westlaw. Unlike the free web, Calor systems tend to give you extensive coverage of legal resources. This is true. This is especially true with case law, and this is, but, it's, uh, but it's often date-restricted on free websites. 
Yet the print collections in a law library provide access to an overwhelming amount of material that has never been placed on Lexis or, or Westlaw. It's gradually being added. But as you'll see, as I move through this lecture, there are some disadvantages to using the computer-assisted legal research in the first place. Myth number three, computer-assisted legal research is less expensive. Well, this can be true for small and solo practice firms. S housing a law library is, takes an incredible amount of space. The space needed to shelf the, uh, the volumes and volumes of case reporters, of, uh, well, mostly case reporters, they take the most space, can be extremely cost prohibitive. And unfortunately, a local library may not be so close to the office uh, to justify frequent travels there. Nonetheless, the holdings of the physical library space of your local library are hands down the least expensive resource for you, especially when you figure in the web's organization of materials versus the paradigms of the legal publication world, which we're going to talk about a little bit more later in this um, lecture and as you move through the course. But legal publishers have editors, and they take these case opinions and other uh, research uh, sources, databases, with, if you will, and they add headnotes and other editorials that save the research hours of, researcher hours of time. The fourth myth is traditional research methods are slower than electronic methods. This one drives me nuts. It's just not true. The statement is partially true, though. The computer is faster for some tasks, like when you need to site check a, t a case or statute, which we're going to learn about as we move through this course and in your legal research class. Or when you have a discrete search for a certain word or phrase that you know, by the way, from experience is going to be out there on the internet or whatever um, paid service you use. Um, or when you need to find opinions written by a particular judge of a circuit or a district or whatever. But for finding cases that express the, the right concept, especially the subtle concepts that aren't easy to uh, express in easy word searches, the book research is going to be faster. The strengths of print resources. They have a table of contents. They have indices. They have digests. They have citators. And they have other access tools that are not available in the, in the electronic world. The myths I explained from the previous slide, I can enhance that here. A few, a few things can be kind of logically deduced from that. First, there are times when computerized legal research is better than manual research, as I noted in the prior slide. However, in a report of the results of an ABA survey that was taken from 2007 to 2012, they reported the percentage of attorneys regularly using print materials across firm size. So that means they didn't control for firm size. They just took the whole group of all firms that, that responded to the survey. Ranged from 39.5% to 62.5%, with an average of 50.2%. So the range of those using regularly the print materials is like 40% to over 62%, an average of 50%. So half of the legal world out there, based on this study, is still using print materials. These, the, why do you think? Because the professionals have experienced the strengths of these items listed in this slide like the tables of contents, the indices, digests, citators, and other access tools that you're going to learn about in both this class and in your PLA 1104 course. These tools have been developed and refined over decades, and they provide access capability that lacks in the results from an online search query. Although some of these tools you know, have been loaded wholesale online, they still lack some of the sophistication those print resources have. An example would be really technically to see relationships among provisions of a code um, because there's a shared context of a code 
If you read a chapter from the Florida Statutes, you will see a shared context of the entire ch uh, chapter. Instead of just narrowing and whittling down to one statute, you don't see that entire context unless you know to look for it. And often the novice legal researcher doesn't know to look for that. Um, so the, and, and the context of the field of practice is uh, more readily noticed when you're using the print resources. Why? Because you're looking at more. You're looking at more. Electronic research, um, electronic research will take you right to a point of information or law, whatever you want to call it, and you stop. And, 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 and electronic researchers who, are, who don't know how to use or don't use the print resources or don't know how to use electronic resources well stop there and forget to look at the entire context. Context, context, context. I use the term a lot in this course in legal research and writing. It's very important to recognize that one legal point, one legal source, a couple of sentences is not enough to take you into the contextual realm of the problem that you're helping to solve. More perspectives from the profession. Remember the survey that I talked about. Um, that's a Thompson West survey, Research Skills for Lawyers and Law School Students. It's a white paper from 2007, a little while ago, but um, it still, uh, in my opinion, has relevance today. Effective research starts with a thorough knowledge of all research. Oh, first year associates are ineffective at legal research. <laughs> ineffective that's just that's just frightening isn't it because they generally start with an online keyword search what they do in doing that is rack up unnecessary billings and online charges because Westlaw is not free LexisNexis is not free and the whole time they've done this they've spent all this time not understanding the context of the results they've retrieved backing up a little bit to my last slide same point is, is relevant here. Um, I want to give you an example of this. I recall once when I had a student do the initial research on a single family dwelling rental dispute. And what I would do when I taught the class was give the students a problem, a case scenario, ask them, go, go, go to the statutes. That's where we should begin our research. In fact, I, I, I do that all the time. Begin with the, with the statutes of Florida and, and come back to me with some information. Now, I want you to know these students did not have a Westlaw password, but I could tell someone had used Westlaw and, or had used online legal research, and this is why. I was totally amazed. The stu student, one of the students came back to class the next week and had this great rule of law. I'm like, wow, what are we, I might have to, you know, shred this case scenario because it's it's too easy to find the answer. That's a perfect answer. It's great. I was amazed that this rule even existed. So I was so impressed I asked the student to cite the case for me or to cite the statute for me. Tell me what statute um, the student had uh, found in the, in the um, research that was done. And uh, I asked for the citation and, and the cita I went I went to the statutes to look at the citation and it was one from the Uniform Commercial Code. I invite you students listening to this lecture.